<laughs> Hello and thanks, Louise and Dan, and welcome everyone to Rip Off Britain Live, where once again we're here to fight your corner when a company's customer service has let you down. Which sadly on this programme we know happens all too often, but when it does, rest assured, because it's our job to make sure that you know exactly what to do next. And I can tell you that we've packed today's programme with real nuggets of totally invaluable advice, some of which could save you a fair amount of money as well. We asked you to tell us what's left you feeling ripped off and you contacted us in your thousands. You've told us about the companies you think get it wrong and the customer service that simply isn't up to scratch. Why can't they all just give it you at the price it should be? They don't, they just try and charge you as much as you can. You've asked us to track down the scammers who stole your money and investigate the extra charges you say are unfair. Very dissatisfied with the way I've been treated and, you know, the whole experience. And when you've lost out but nobody else is to blame, you've come to us to stop others falling into the same trap. It makes me feel very angry because I can't get through to anybody when I need help. So whether it's a blatant rip-off or a genuine mistake, we're here to find out why you are out of pocket and what you can do about it. Your stories, your money. This is Rip Off Britain. Hello and welcome to Rip Off Britain. We're here live every morning this week tackling the big stories that you've asked us to investigate. And I must say, thanks to your suggestions, we've been having an absolute blast, haven't we? We, we really have, you know. And uh, the best part of it all is seeing all the comments that you've been sending us while we're live on air. Now, sadly, we may not have time to include all of them in the programme, but I do promise you that every single one helps us decide which topics we're going to look at on future programmes. So we really are grateful to everyone who's been in touch. We are. And we're also <laughs> hoping that you'll do exactly the same thing again this morning. And we're going to be getting our teeth into something that's a frustration for millions of us, the cost of fuel for your car. And in particular, how the price can vary. And this is really frustrating, not just in different parts of the country, but even between neighbouring branches of the same company. I thought, what's going on? How many other Asda's are doing this? How many Tesco's are doing this? All the other supermarkets, all different prices for different areas. Well, as we get to the bottom of that, stand by for some great tips on where you'll find the best price at the pumps. Plus, of course, our experts will be tackling more of your problems outside in our pop-up advice clinic. And today we've got Legal Eagle Gary Rycroft. He's back for his second stint of the week. And he'll be joined by Martin James from the Complaint Service Resolver. And do remember, if you've got a question for either of them that uh, you would like them to answer for you, well, you can email right away because we're at ripoffbritain at bbc.co.uk and we're also on Facebook. But first thing this morning, a genuinely shocking story with implications that you probably haven't stopped to even think about. And I have to admit straight away that I certainly had not. Mm. And nor had the people we we're about to meet, one of whom couldn't have had a better reason for wanting the situation resolved. It's said that most people using social media now do so for two hours a day. Sharing, liking, tweeting and updating your pictures has become so commonplace that you can pretty much learn someone's whole life story just by checking out their profile page. But when we're no longer around to update it all, the question of what happens to our online lives is less clear cut. It's not something that Nick Gazzard from Gloucester had ever even stopped to consider, until that is his daughter Holly was tragically stabbed to death at the hairdressing salon where she worked back in February 2014. Well, I am in front of Fringe Benefits where Holly Gazard worked and, of course, where the attack happened on Tuesday night. Well, since then, tributes have been paid on social media websites. Holly was a bright, vivacious, fun-loving individual. She loved social media, and if you look at her Facebook page, you know, she had masses and masses of pictures of her, her friends, the things she was doing. Sadly, Holly was killed by her ex-boyfriend, who was given a life sentence. But just weeks after her death, to her devastated family's complete surprise, the 20-year-old's Facebook page was suddenly frozen in time, memorialized, as the company calls it, as a sort of ongoing tribute. Well, as soon as we heard from one of Holly's friends that the page had been memorialized, we, we straight away went into Facebook to see what was happening. And there it was, you know, on the front of that, in memory of Holly Gazard. We don't know how, why, or who actually memorialized the account. We presume it was Facebook, but how they did that, possibly because through the media interest. We, we, we just do not know. But when Nick looked at the site more closely, 
to his absolute horror, 12 photographs of his daughter with the man who had stabbed her were still viewable on her profile page. There were pictures of her and the person that had murdered her. And when all his family and friends went in to look at her account, they got incredibly upset and traumatised by seeing those photos, quite understandably. When Nick contacted Facebook, he assumed that removing the distressing photos would be straightforward, but I'm afraid that wasn't the case. They came back and said, no, we can't remove those photos. All we can do is we can either close the account down uh, or leave it as is. And obviously we didn't want the account closed down because there are lots of photos of there of Holly that people wanted to remember Holly by because that's her legacy. Despite Nick's attempts to get the photos removed, the social media website refused to make any change. It said it doesn't alter memorialized pages, which meant Holly's family were left traumatized any time they saw a picture of her with her killer. We found the whole process very insensitive, treated as a, a tick box exercise and not really as uh, a case by case basis, which, you know, just listen to what we're trying to tell you uh, and have a, an ounce of humanity in you to say, yeah, we can see why you'd want those pictures removed. Eventually, 19 months after his daughter's death, Facebook did remove the images, which Nick says came after he'd written to the company, withdrawing the copyright of the photos that Holly had taken. We could now go in and we could look at Holly's account without having the trauma of seeing the individual that ended her life. We then sent an email around to her friends to say that they can go back in and enjoy her account again. Our legal expert, Gary Rycroft, who chairs the Law Society Group, looking into what's usually called our digital assets, thinks that in situations like this one, Facebook could show more flexibility. They are also not complying with the usual legal protocol of taking instructions from a person who is defined in law as having authority to deal with a deceased person's estate, namely an executor or administrator. Facebook are trying to do their own thing and create their own rules. In July 2015, around the same time it took down Holly's killer's pictures, Facebook did change its settings to allow users to nominate a legacy contact. In other words, someone who can take control of your profile after your death. And when we got in touch, the company said when people come to Facebook after suffering a loss, it wants them to feel comfort, not pain. It says when pages are memorialized at the request of a friend or a family member, it tries to protect the wishes of the person who has died by leaving the account exactly as they left it. So nothing can be removed or changed as a way of respecting the choices someone made while alive. But all of this raises a much bigger question of who owns or controls the things we put online, which odds are you won't have thought about. Because most of us struggle to get our heads around what our digital assets even are, let alone what will happen to them when we're gone. Not, I have no idea what not, a digital not the asset is. Go on, you answer that one. Oh, I don't know. No. I've, I've never heard of it, to be honest. How can you own anything that's digital? I have no idea. Sorry. I, I suppose it's, it's, it's technology that's supposed to make my life better. Well, I'm glad it's not just me that's confused. But whether you've stopped to think about digital assets or not, they take in a lot more than simply your profile on social media. There are digital assets with clear financial value, such as bank accounts that you access online, or maybe things with sentimental value. So the photographs that you access through a social media account. And Gary says leaving clear instructions about what should happen to these digital assets is going to be increasingly important when it comes to sorting out the affairs of a loved one who has died. There are two crucial elements to a digital will. One is to name people who will look after your digital assets on death, to tidy up your social media account. And then the other aspect of it is, of course, deciding what should happen to your digital assets, such as a blog or a website. Who should receive the benefit of those assets on your death? But all of this isn't just something to worry about in the future with so many of us now moving away from keeping hard copies of valuables like photos and instead using virtual storage online. Understanding the terms and conditions of the various digital companies you might sign up to could prove vital if you want to keep hold of your stuff. A different social media provider will have different rules about 
how they will look after your storage and who owns what. And that's something that grain buyer John Morley from Lincoln found out to his cost. Like many people, he thought the safest place to store his files and photos was an online drive, which means that if your smartphone or laptop breaks, or it's stolen or lost, you can easily get everything back. John paid an annual subscription of £59 from Microsoft Office, which automatically provided him with the company's storage service, OneDrive. Once uh, OneDrive was up and working and I got confidence in it, I stopped backing up in any other way. Uh, and that worked for ages quite well. Well, not quite well, extremely well. For the next couple of years, John was more than happy with OneDrive, using it to upload everything from family photographs to the accounts and contracts for his grain business. But then one day, without warning, all of it just disappeared. Panic is what happened when I suddenly went onto OneDrive and all my data was missing. Uh, what do I do now? John immediately contacted Microsoft's technical department, who reassured him that they would do everything they could to retrieve his data. But as the weeks went by, with no news or no resolution, John's business was missing three years of accounts and contracts. That is an awful lot of data you wouldn't really believe, but in business you have to keep paper backups of every transaction you've done. Uh, and I used those in order to re-input uh, some of the missing information. After six weeks, John had to accept that his precious documents were gone for good. Microsoft haven't been any more assistance, so they, in the end, said that uh, they'd done all they could, they were very sorry they'd uh, lost the data, uh, and they couldn't help any more. Absolutely terrifying to think it had just vanished into thin air, which is why Gary says it's so important to understand any downsides to so-called cloud-based storage systems before you sign up. What will happen if they lose the data? What arrangements do they have to get it back? What insurance do they have in place to cover any financial loss that you might suffer if they do lose your data? These are all sensible questions that you should be asking. We're all guilty of just ticking the, I accept the terms and conditions, and we really need to understand what we're signing up to. Of course, cloud-based storage can work really well. And the big players, Amazon, Apple, Google and Microsoft, are most likely to be around in the long term. But prices and terms may well change. And if you're going to store photographs for 50 years, the cost will add up. So copying everything onto a hard drive at home is Gary's number one piece of advice. Have a physical backup of your precious photographs. Print them off, put them in an album. With regard to your data, have a local backup. I think we're getting very complacent about how reliable the digital world is. We need to get our heads around having our digital world brought back into the real world in order to keep it safe. That's advice that John is already acting on, and he's determined not to fall into the same trap again. I don't rely on OneDrive anymore. I never would. Uh, what I do now is I back up everything on, from each computer onto one of these uh, stick drives, uh, which means it's all under my control. I can understand why he's doing that, and I reckon his experience will have a lot of people worrying if anything that they've stored online might suddenly vanish into the clouds. But I'm afraid Microsoft hasn't really provided much of an explanation as to what went wrong. They certainly haven't. All that the company has said is that it's looking into it. And it's contacted John directly to provide further assistance. But uh, in order to respect customer security and privacy, it cannot share additional details with us at this time. Which is a bit ironic because mm. John did provide Microsoft with written consent to discuss his case. So I'm afraid it all remains something of a mystery. Indeed, and our legal expert, Gary Rycroft, is busy today. He's with us in the studio. And that was a very comprehensive report. And I want to deal with John's case, first of all. Is there anything more you think that he could have done? Well, I think John's learned his lesson, so it's wonderful to have things stored in the cloud, but we need to bring things back into the real world. He needs his local backup. But could he have sued them, for example, for all that loss of information? He certainly had a contract with them to keep his information safe, and that hasn't happened, so he needs to take further legal advice about that, certainly. Now, it's really funny because, you know, digital assets means actually pre precious little to me as I don't do anything online. But I asked around a lot of people in my own little survey, and they all went, like the film, 
I haven't a clue really what you're talking about. So it's a new area even for you lawyers. It is. Lawyers are beginning to realise that this is an area that they're having to look at, both at the stage where people are making wills, so planning what should happen to their assets on death, and, of course, at this stage when people have died and their estates are being sorted out afterwards. Who owns what? Well, it's, a, it, it's complicated because you might think that you own, for instance, your photographs, and like Holly's dad in the film, Holly owned the copyright to those pictures and that passed on to him and his wife when Holly died. But the question is, who owns the underlying data? Who owns the right for you to, to display those photographs? And to work around that, you've come up with this phrase, a legacy contact. Now, in practical terms, what does that mean? Well, Facebook used this page because they've recognised that they have users who are dying and they are encouraging people to appoint a legacy contact. So that's a person who will be in charge of your Facebook page after you have died. I would call them a kind of digital e executor. Like the executor of your, your paper will. Exactly. So are you, are you, as a lawyer, are you advising, you know, a digital will as well as a paper will? It's always a good idea to have a will in place if you're aged at over 18 years. And if you have a will and have executors, they're the people who will be responsible for looking after your estate on death. But yes, you can have digital executors as well, who are the people who will curate your digital life after you've died. And very quickly, you know, the most horrific thing in that film to me was the fact that that poor father, in terms of having lost his daughter, couldn't get those pictures taken off Facebook. I mean, that, that's terrible. Yeah, I think Facebook uses a very blunt instrument when someone dies in terms of saying we will either delete the account or we will uh, leave it as it is. And actually, sometimes people want something in the middle. The people who are left behind want to grieve and grieve in their own way. I would say they need a bit more heart, don't you? A bit more heart, exactly. definitely. Thanks, Gary. Well, now we want to have... A big thank you to all of you for the messages that you sent on the stories that we covered yesterday. And it's fair to say we've been inundated with comments mm -hmm. about the banks after we heard how the TV presenter Charlie Webster had had a terrible time with fraudsters repeatedly targeting her account. Indeed, an awful lot of you have emailed us with your own dreadful experiences of fraud, situations that you say were made even worse by the way that your bank handled it all. And there were also very plenty, uh, plenty of very sensible questions around as well. So so um, we can assure you we're going to be looking into some of those much more closely and coming back to the topic on one of our programmes next year. In the meantime, we heard from loads of you about and your very, very cross rail passengers, and I bet there are some of you today, judging by what's been going on, after our report on the reliability or not of UK trains. William Carroll from Newcastle emailed comparing them unfavourably to the service in Japan. He says he could set his watch by Japanese trains punctuality. And by Swiss, German and French trains too, probably. While Catherine Wallace asks how season ticket holders can get fair compensation for poor service. Well, Catherine, if you uh, get no joy at all from the company itself, it does sound exactly the sort of thing that the new rail ombudsman might be able to help you with. But actually, to be fair, it wasn't all bad news on that score. A number of you had positive things to say about how easily you've been able to claim compensation for delays. And some of you were at least able to let off a bit of vicarious steam watching Angela's, shall we say, lively exchange with the man from the rail delivery group. Watch this. <laughs> You need to look at how the plumbing, the architecture of the industry uh, can be realigned to make it work much better uh, for passengers because clearly it's been a difficult summer. I love your optimism and I love the way you stand up for the industry, but, you know, let's be honest about this. The plumbing, as you call it, has got several leaks in it. <laughs> he was only doing his best, Angela. I know, but I'm there to answer on behalf of the viewers. <laughs> True. <laughs> and on another topic, several of you pointed out that we didn't mention how to report instances of those robocalls mm. that we highlighted in our pop-up shop, including Dawn Sinclair, who received one just minutes after wow. that item went out. They're chillingly threatening, weren't they? Well, the yeah. best advice in order to report that is by contacting Action Fraud, which ideally you should do online because it won't cost you anything. And the address is Action Fraud dot police dot UK. But if you can't do that, then you can call them on 0300 123 2040. That phone line is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., but there is a standard call charge, so you will have to pay for it. Now, we all know how the cost of petrol can change from day to day. In fact, prices this year were the highest for four mm. and a half years. But it's not the whole story. No, indeed. Some of you have spotted some very surprising variations in cost that, over time, really can add up. So, as we're finding out why that is, get ready for some tips on how to get the best value the next time that you fill up. 
The cost of fueling up your motor has always left British drivers seeing red. They're ripping us off and people are taking stands at now. For decades, the price at the pumps has been a touch paper for anger and frustration. It often feels like the cost to consumers only goes one way. There's been a national feeling of anger building up that when oil prices go up, pump prices rocket almost instantaneously. And with prices this year reaching highs not seen for quite some time, many of you say you're really feeling the pinch. It's disgusting how expensive fuel prices are. It's not something I can afford, and I don't think it's something that's warranted at all. I have to use my car, and it's affecting my household budget. It's quite frustrating, it's quite a worry at the end of the month, to be honest. What are we supposed to do? Tommy Cordock from East Manchester feels the same. But his big beef over the price at the pumps has been fueled by something rather different. The variations between one forecourt and another, even when they belong to the same chain. He wants to know why that is, as even just a small difference really can mount up over time. Hi, Sam. You're from school now. All right, mate. I'll come pick it up. And he's very much aware of that, because twice a week, he does a 24-mile round trip ferrying his grandson, Sam, to and from his favourite bike track. Oh, it's costing me a fortune, but it's... Um, if he enjoys it, I enjoy it. It's just a granddad, grandson thing that we do. It's often while he's fulfilling his grandparent duties that he takes the opportunity to fill up at the pumps of a nearby supermarket. Basically, I use Asda because it, it's convenient for me to go there when I'm taking Sam to, to his BMX lesson. I can book him in, put him on the track, and I can go out and get petrol and knowing that he's safe inside there and then park back up again when I've got the fuel. But one day, on the drive home, he spotted that his local Asda, five miles away from where he'd just filled up, was selling unleaded fuel for 5p less. I thought, what's going on? How many other Asdas are doing this? How many Tesco's are doing this? All the other supermarkets, all different prices for different areas. And whilst 5p doesn't sound like a lot, over a year, that would have cost Tommy an extra £60. Pounds. I feel ripped off, basically. Why should I pay Asda one price and the other Asda another price for exactly the same product? Since spotting that price gap, Tommy's kept a watchful eye on the two Asda forecourts, and he says there's been a consistent 3 to 4p difference between them. I think it's wrong. and They can't justify it. Or can they justify it? Why are there different prices in different areas? So we asked Tommy to put that to one man who really knows his fuel, Simon Williams from the RAC. I think supermarkets are clearly operating a regional pricing uh, strategy, and that you know sometimes even more locally than that. Why they choose to charge slightly more in one location than another is really probably down to market dynamics. So it's good old-fashioned local competition that determines how each supermarket branch might price its fuel. And Simon points out that prices at these stores are designed not just to tempt you into filling up your tank, but your shopping trolley too. There's a lot of competition over fuel uh, for supermarkets as a footfall driver to get people into store. They might even do it almost as a loss leader. It's about driving people into store to buy food, groceries, non-food items. Supermarkets have a huge stake in the UK petrol market because although they only have around 16% of UK forecourts, they're responsible for some 44% of total fuel sales. That means lower overheads and higher turnover. But does it mean they offer the best price? Well, to find out, we asked the team monitoring fuel costs for the website petrolprices.com to crunch the numbers on the forecourts for 2018 so far, to see which brands, supermarket or otherwise, typically offer the best deal. Coming out as generally having the priciest pumps was BP, with an average price this year of £1.27.8 per litre of unleaded. Just a fraction cheaper was Shell, closely followed by Gulf, Esso, 
and then a mix of smaller and less familiar names. So far, we're talking only a very small difference in price. But when you get to the top of our chart, there's a bit more of a jump. Supermarkets do come out with the best prices overall, with Tesco more than 2p cheaper than the names below it. Cheaper still is Morrison's, closely followed by Sainsbury's. But the king of lower-priced petrol for 2018 so far is Asda, at £1.21.1 .1 pence per litre. That means, on average, filling up at Asda rather than BP would save you £3.68p per tank, which, based on the average annual fuel consumption, could leave you with an extra £55 in your pocket. Of course, the trouble is, not everyone has a choice of where to get their fuel. John Smith lives in the rural town of Lauder in the Scottish Borders, where there is only one petrol station. 135.9 for diesel per litre. Quite expensive. If you're not happy with the price here, it's a seven-mile trip down the road to the next garage, where on this occasion John would pay the same. 135.9 a litre for diesel and 132.9 a litre for unleaded. That's quite expensive compared to Edinburgh prices. John regularly travels into Edinburgh, so, like Tommy, typically fills up at those cheaper supermarket pumps while he's in the city. But he doesn't think it's right that the fuel closer to home should cost him so much more. If you go into a supermarket and you go to the shelves, the price of a loaf of bread is the same as it is in cities. It's, no, it's comparable, there's no difference whatsoever. There is a difference in fuel prices, though. Um, in some cases, quite a marked difference. John is right. We asked petrolprices.com to check exactly what that difference is. And its team compared the price of a litre of unleaded fuel where John lives in Lauder to the price in Edinburgh during the last month. There was a 5p difference, which, over a year, with John typically clocking up about 11,000 miles, means it would be around £55 more expensive to fill up at his local pump than it would be in the city. The unfortunate thing about living in a rural area is that we have to rely on our cars. We don't have a choice. We've been held over a barrel, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it's fair. Well, fair or not, it's a situation replicated across the country. Petrolprices.com looked at average forecourt prices across the UK from the start of this year. And the four places that came out cheapest for buying petrol were all towns on the outskirts of cities. Lee in Manchester bagged the top spot with a very competitive price of £1.16 pence per litre of unleaded. As for the four most expensive spots for filling up, well, that list was dominated by small villages on the western fringes of Scotland. But costliest of all was Woolacombe in Devon, another coastal village, where the average price for 2018 was £1.46 pence per litre. That means a tank of unleaded would cost £16.50 more in Woolacombe than 270 miles away in Lee. Petrolprices.com boss Jason Lloyd says that's down to simple market economics. There is more uh, demand in urban areas and more competition. So therefore, the stations compete with each other by lowering the price. In rural areas, the retailers there increase the prices to take advantage of the fact that there's less competition around them. Industry experts also point out that while the petrol stations in more remote villages, such as those on the Scottish islands, may charge more, they're also providing an important community service. But even those cheaper prices in Lee are a far cry from the prices we were paying just a few years ago, when some pump prices dipped below a pound. And Tommy got to the bottom of why that's the case, when he grilled Simon from the RAC. Who governs the petrol prices of how they go up and how they come down? The deciding factors of what we pay at the pump relate to um, the price of oil 
and the exchange rate. And actually, oil has gone up. It's currently at around $82 a barrel, which is the highest it's been since um, November 2014, when we could regularly get petrol and diesel for under a pound mm. at the supermarkets. It's those rising prices and a weak pound that have pushed up the wholesale price of fuel and therefore the price of your petrol. But when the market does fluctuate, the RAC thinks fuel operators could reflect it much more fairly. Just at the moment, we've seen um, the wholesale price come down by about 3p, and it took quite some time, probably about uh, 10 days or more, for retailers to actually decide to pass on those savings to motorists at the pumps. With prices changing by the day, a good way to find the best deals in your area is to use one of the free apps that you can download on your phone. And there are also websites that give daily price checks. But Jason Lloyd from petrolprices.com says no matter what the price at the pump, you can still save with a bit of forward thinking. Plan your journeys. Try to avoid motorway services and know where the cheaper sites are just off the motorway. Drive efficiently. Don't fill your tank to the maximum. Only fill it halfway. But for Tommy and John, it's a matter of principle. They're convinced that fuel could be priced more fairly. They're forcing me away to go and search for further petrol, putting more mileage on my car. I don't know why they tried to get away with it, and I feel as though we're getting penalised. Well, it's something that really affects us all. Mm. And the big name that came out worse in that report of price checks was BP, which told that it only sets the prices at the 300 or so service stations it owns and operates itself. And those prices take into account the convenience of the location and local competition. Then it says that the remaining 900 are dealer owned and operated, so BP doesn't actually set the price. As for the issues raised in our two case studies, John's local petrol station is run by the co-op, which told us that its fuel is competitively priced to meet local demand, and it provides a valuable service in rural areas where provision is often limited. And then responding to Tommy's concerns, Asda says it has a national price cap on fuel to ensure that no customer ever pays more than that amount. It also says that it lists all its fuel prices online. Well, joining me now is Edmund King, who's the president of the AA. I think, Edmund, that most people would recognise the commercial competition that there is, but what they don't understand is the variations in price for the same chain, be it BP, Tesco, whatever, when you can go in and buy a bar of chocolate or a loaf of bread, as we heard in the film, and that price doesn't change. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, we saw in the film a 5p a litre difference, but we've actually looked at Hampshire and there's a 10p a litre difference. 10p from Liphook in Hampshire to another village 19 miles down the road, and it's the same chain. So there's no justification for that. Obviously, if it's an extreme rural area like the islands and highlands of Scotland, you can understand why prices might be more expensive, but not 19 miles down the road in Hampshire. No, I mean, I've seen figures that say that in the rural areas you might get 30 passengers, 30 drivers a day, whereas in the middle of a city you'd get 3,000. Yeah, we, in a we day. have some sympathy for the rural garages because they are an essential service. In 2015, the government actually did cut fuel duty by 5p a litre for 17 extremely rural areas. So they have to charge a bit more because they don't have the turnover. But really, in our towns and cities, it should be much more competitive and prices should be cheaper. Is there nothing the government can do to, to get over what, what I believe is called the rocket and the mm. feather situation, where when the wholesale price goes up, it rockets at the pump, but when the wholesale price comes down, it's like a feather dropping very, very slow before it actually gets reflected on what we're buying as consumers. Yeah, indeed, this happens all the time. We've seen it recently with 3 and 4p a litre increases that rapidly increase at the pumps, but when the price comes down, they don't decrease. Now, what the government can do, they can be much more transparent. We've asked, like they do in Australia and the USA, that you publish the wholesale prices, you then publish the retail prices, and then the driver can see if they're being taken for a ride, if there's a great discrepancy between those prices. And it makes a difference, particularly to those on low incomes who spend a set amount on fuel. 40% spend, spend a set amount on fuel. And obviously, if the price is much higher, the car won't go as far. Very briefly, 
Why should we only put half a tank of petrol in? Well, that advice is really for eco-driving, less weight. But obviously, if you come across a garage that's got very cheap fuel, I'd say fill up quickly. Great advice. Thanks very much indeed, Edmund. We've got more good advice coming up now because Julia is outside with our consumer experts at our pop-up shop. Indeed I am. I'm out here with Shumin Poo, who's a Pilates instructor from South West London, and she's come to get some advice from Gary Rycroft. Now, you took your uh, laptop in to be repaired because it had gone wrong. You'd only had it three years, but you took it in there and you paid extra for an express service. Yes. But uh, what actually happened? Yes, I was given three choices and choose the most expensive one, which is 24 hours express service. They didn't fix it the next day. I asked for a refund, they rejected. So, what's her position, Gary? Well, in legal terms, Schumann made time of the essence part of the contract, which means that you made it part of the contract that they would perform a task for you within a defined time period, and that didn't happen. So I think you've got a strong case for asking for a refund for that part of the contract. They did provide you with a diagnosis of the, the situation, so perhaps you should pay them for that part of it, but certainly not pay the extra for the express service you didn't get. Now, I've got to say, the shop did say that they thought they were just going to diagnose the problem within 24 hours, not repair it. But if she appeals to their better nature, that's really what you're suggesting, I think isn't so. It? She's a very charming lady, so I think you should appeal to their better nature. And also, for me, the interesting point is that you had a laptop that after three years broke. Go back to your retailer and try and get it sorted through your retailer. Well, there you are. A little bit of advice for you. Thank you. Good luck with it. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Schumann. Now, uh, over here, I've got Martin James from uh, the consumer website Resolver. And in this case, what we want to know about is if somebody wants to get out of their broadband contract early, can they, will they be made to pay to do it? Well, they certainly will be. And the exit fees for broadband contracts can be huge. I get loads of complaints about them, sometimes more than £200. Now, sometimes you've got no choice. Um, if you want to move broadband to another area, maybe the provider doesn't provide that service there. And yet some companies have still been charging people exit fees, which is terribly unfair. So what, put, what should people do to make sure they're not, they don't end up paying what they shouldn't? Well, the most important thing to do is to prepare in advance before you sign a contract. It makes sense to think about whether you're going to have any big lifestyle changes if you can in the next year or two. Don't sign up for two years if you think you're going to be staying put at home. But if you're treated unfairly, if your service is terrible, for example, um, if you do have to move somewhere else, then put a complaint in. We really do believe that these exit fees shouldn't apply. Um, and there's a free ombudsman service as well if you want to take it further. Free ombudsman, that's what we like to hear. Now back to you girls in the studio. I love that bit, you know, I just love all that instant advice because yes. we're live all week. Now, there are a couple of quite startling stories in the papers. They're very interesting, in fact, mm. because the Mirror says that £1.6 million uh, lost in pensions, so one, sorry, £1.6 million in terms of numbers uh, of lost pensions worth £13,000 each. And according to the Association of British Insurers, there's a jaw-dropping total of £20 billion lying unclaimed by people who've lost track of work pensions and savings. I suppose in some case some it? people... It is staggering. Yeah. Some people maybe just forget. Forget uh, about it. Well, we were all, I say, in the studio astonished to see this rather depressing sign of the times in the mail. BA apparently takes calls for just four hours a day. The customer service line of British Airways is now apparently open only between 1 o'clock and 5 p.m. on weekdays and not at all at weekends, while the rest of the time is spent dealing with online queries. Now, BA says that it assists up to 20,000 customers Customers every week and its social media team answers requests 24 hours a day but it's been I think quite rightly accused of discriminating mm. against the millions of people who have never used the internet this is the national carrier for it it is and um, like me I never use the internet so I want okay. to speak to a person on the phone yeah so that was really bad however more positively also in the mail news of a pioneering scheme at a car park in Leeds and well done Leeds because it makes mm. very good use of those plastic bottles that we're all trying to cut down on Britain's first car park where you can get cash off if you bring in bottles. Every plastic bottle gets you 20p off. So it combines the idea of recycling with saving money. So what's not to love? We like that story, don't I we? I like it. Well, earlier we were talking about frustration over the way that banks handle fraud. But earlier in the year, of course, one bank got into a bit of bother while upgrading its everyday business. In the summer, we reported on what's been one of the biggest consumer stories of the year, the crisis at one of Britain's best-known banks, TSB. 
A transfer to new IT systems in mid-April led to a huge technical collapse that left almost 2 million people with problems with their online banking. It took days for the system to be up and running again, and for some customers, weeks went by and things still weren't right. Many of you told us how upset you were at the way the bank had handled it all. Their attitude, absolutely appalling. They clearly don't have enough staff to deal with all the problems. I really think some major changes need to happen with TSB before anyone could have any confidence with them again. Well, there have now been major changes at TSB. In September, the bank's chief executive, Paul Pester, stepped down, with the bank saying there was still more to do to achieve full stability for customers. But in the middle of September, another British banking giant, Barclays, was also thrown into IT chaos when millions of its customers found themselves unable to log into their accounts. Barclays' online and telephone banking systems had crashed after suffering a technical glitch. Whilst this particular meltdown was resolved six hours later, it left plenty of customers concerned about the safety of their balances. And as more of us do our banking online, you can't help wondering if the technical systems of Britain's major banks are quite as robust as you'd expect. Well, obviously, Barclays' difficulties were nothing like the same scale as happened at TSB. The bank says only a small number of customers were briefly affected by three separate incidents, but they could still do their day-to-day -day banking in other ways, and with cash points and debit cards unaffected, there was no problem getting hold of cash. That's what they say. Now, all morning, our inbox has been buzzing with questions for our experts, so let's get some answers. And first up, it's to Gary. Following on from our chat about express services, Reynold recently ordered some items on next day delivery, which didn't arrive, so were returned to the retailer, who is now charging in for storage. What can he do? This is absolutely <laughs> outrageous. Uh, when you order things online, the retailer has a duty to get them to you. Mm -hmm. And here's a tip that I picked up from our wonderful finance expert, Sarah Pennells. Don't fill in the box to say, leave it in the shed. Make sure that they have to deliver it to you in person, because until it's delivered, it's their responsibility. Wow. Good tip. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, this one for you. Uh, Bridget Ridgen booked a cruise and she paid £350 for an upgrade, but two weeks ago she saw the same upgrade being offered for free. What can she do, apart well, from be very cross? Well, very cross <laughs> indeed, I would be too. <laughs> this is one of those frustrating things that happens a lot with holiday bookings, yeah. but she can make a complaint about it on the grounds that she paid for a specific service that's now being shared to everybody. Um, there isn't a strong enough ombudsman, really. There are a couple of schemes you can go to if things go wrong, but I would encourage you to make a complaint if they say no. Right, Gary, back to you. Now, Vivian Davies bought her daughter a mobile phone contract before, very sadly, she died. Now, the phone company says she can't now cancel the contract as Vivian doesn't have enough proof that she's in charge of the account. A sad case, but what can she do? Again, this is, this is terrible. If her daughter was under 18 years, then, as the parent, she absolutely has parental responsibility. Mm -hmm. If her daughter was over 18 years, then she just needs a death certificate, perhaps a grant of probate, to show she's the person responsible for the estate. But this is very insensitive and it really upsets me it's to It's another situation like where companies are not using common sense, isn't it? And no heart. Mm, yeah. no. I mean, the, the thing is, yeah. you would imagine that there'd be circumstances that they would bend the rule on, don't you think? Yeah, terrible, terrible yeah. situation. Mm. But there we go. Yeah, well, it's heart that we're all about in the end. <laughs> all of us. All of us. <laughs> on that note, we're out of time. We're going to be back tomorrow hearing some awful stories about people who've been sweet-talked out of their pensions. That's a big one. And we'll have the advice that you need to make sure that the same pension disasters don't happen to you. As always, the programme will be full of information you won't want to miss. 9.15 tomorrow. Until then, thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.